This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, maybe you didn't miss us, but we certainly have been thinking about you all week. So glad you tuned in for another edition of the Farm Monitor. If you are a first time viewer, greetings and welcome. Absolutely. And hopefully you'll like what we have in store for you. Coming up, get ready to see the best of the best in livestock as 4-H and FFA students from across Georgia converge in Perry for the Junior National Livestock Show. A full report on the competition and camaraderie. Also on the show, county presidents from Georgia Farm Bureau take on Capitol Hill. Hear about their mission to advocate for Georgia agriculture and the key issues they discussed with lawmakers. And then later, he's not your average chef. He's also a Georgia Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers leader. The story of Cam Floyd and how he uses farm fresh ingredients to advocate for agriculture. All of this and more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. Cows, goats, pigs, you name it, and chances are it was on display as some of the top 4-H and FFA livestock exhibitors in the state traveled to Perry for the Georgia Junior National Livestock Show. Damon Jones reports on how this annual showcase provides a nice mix of healthy competition. Hundreds of 4-H and FFA students from around the state descended upon the Georgia National Fairgrounds looking to prove that they are the best of the best in the world of livestock showing. It's the premier event in Georgia, spotlighting all of the blood, sweat, and tears these exhibitors have put in over the past year. So this event is really important to these students. They've put a lot of hard work and time and, and money and investment into these projects. And so um, they really um, like to see um, come and compete with their animals. Um, but it really is just a fun time for, for friends and family and ag teachers and 4-H agents to really share their passion for the agricultural industry. That sentiment is shared by all of the competitors as they get a unique opportunity to see old friends while also making some new ones with people that share their same passion for animal husbandry. Getting to see friends that I don't get to see all the time. You know, I love showing, I love being in the ring, I love working my animals, but it's such a great experience to, to see the folks that I only get to see maybe once or twice a year. I love it. You know, this is what I live for. I've been able to show cattle for the past eight years. Uh, coming to Perry, Georgia to exhibit at our uh, Georgia National State Show is such, a, it's such an amazing experience. Uh, just the, the people that I'm surrounded by is what makes it so great. A lot of people, if you ask around, this is their favorite place on earth, right? The Disney World for livestock exhibitors. But, you know, it's just a time to get together with a lot of folks that enjoy doing the same thing as you do and um, get to show off the, the fruits of their labor. However, all of that solidarity takes a back seat once the competition begins, as these students are looking for a little bit of bragging rights, as well as prize money for all the work that went into grooming their animals. When we're in the ring, it's go time. It's go time. The friendships can wait until we come out, but most definitely there's a huge competitive edge in the show ring in Perry, Georgia. We're in the barn rinsing cattle, walking cattle, feeding every day throughout the year, Monday or Sunday to Saturday. Uh, it's every day we have to keep our cattle in the best shape possible uh, so that we can be competitive. While reaching this level of livestock showing is a major time investment, these students are sure to reap the benefits of that type of commitment over their lifetime. The Livestock Project is a very valuable experience. I mean, granted, it is a lot of hard work, but it teaches so many valuable lessons to these young people. And so if anyone has any interest in animal science or livestock at all, this is a great project to really hone those skills. I'd say be willing to step out and try something new. Uh, you know, showing to me at one time it was foreign. Uh, but the more and more time I spent in the show barn and with those around me, uh, it really it really allowed me to open up and, and offer that competitive edge and, and have some success. Reporting from Houston County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Advocacy in action. That's what took place in Washington, D.C. as Georgia Farm Bureau County presidents headed to our nation's capital. As John Holcomb reports, the trip couldn't have come at a better time as lawmakers began talks on issues and bills that are vital to Georgia agriculture. For the first time in three years, Georgia Farm Bureau legislative staff, directors, and county presidents made the trip to Washington to advocate for the ag industry, something GFB President Tom McCall says is vitally important, especially at a time with so much hanging in the balance for farmers and producers across the country. 
Well, you know, it's good to get back to uh, bringing presidents uh, to, to at Washington to meet with their congressmen. Uh, that we hope there's going to be a farm bill written uh, this year. Uh, it's time for a new farm bill, and we need to put, have our input on what Georgia needs. And as far as uh, the products that we grow, we need to have our input uh, into how the farm bill is going to be written. I think it makes a lot of difference because they're hearing from home folks and folks that vote for them, and the strength of Farm Bureau that we have in the state of Georgia is recognized by not only our state uh, elected people, but also the uh, national elected people. The trip couldn't have come at a better time as the ag industry is facing a number of issues, such as high input costs, high interest rates, and low commodity prices, something Austin Scott, vice chair of the House Ag Committee, says is a focus of his and the committee this Congress. Most of the farmers that I know are very concerned that commodity prices fall uh, while, while inputs stay up. One of the things that we're going to take a very serious look at is reference prices in the farm bill and, and making sure that we move those so that they, we take into account the increased cost of production. So, so we're, we're very concerned about the increased risk of, of uh, the ag economy and therefore rural America's economy that, that exists in, in production agriculture. And, and from a global standpoint, what that means for the United States and the rest of the world is that if you have uh, farmers planting fewer acres because they're wanting to become uh, more risk averse, then you then you actually have less food supply, not not just for the U.S. but for uh, other parts of the world. This year is also when the current farm bill is set to expire, which means policy hearings and meetings are underway on Capitol Hill to get a new bill written and passed, which, according to Scott, is going to be a challenge, as more than 80 percent of the bill is for nutrition, leaving what's left to be figured out how to protect our nation's farmers and producers. 82% of farm bill spending now goes to some type of food and nutri nutritional program. Uh, that leaves you, now you've taken 82 cents of every dollar that, that's going to nutrition, that leaves you about 18 cents. They get split between crop insurance and conservation and commodities. And so then we've got to figure out the way to best spend uh, the money in the farm bill to make sure that we're reducing the risk for the ag producer. Uh, and, and that's going to come from making sure that we have uh, new crop insurance products out there, uh, specialty crops, fruits, vegetables. Uh, most of those producers are buying, uh, we're paying into the NAP system, non-insurable uh, crop assistance program. That doesn't work very well for, for those products. Uh, we don't have anything for pecan trees, citrus, and other things. So we need more risk management tools out there. And that's one of the things that I hope we do is to, is to get more money into the crop insurance system and give more products available to the producers that are out there. Reporting in Washington for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. This leader of young farmers is not only an expert in agriculture, but also a master chef, bringing farm to table cuisine to new levels of deliciousness. Get ready to be impressed by his talent both in and out of the kitchen when the Farm Monitor continues. They say you should never judge a book by its cover. Well, Cam Floyd, who is chairman of the Georgia Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee for Douglas County, is one of those books. His cover, the tattoos, say nothing about his love of farming and agriculture or that he even considers himself a farmer. But he is, and a good one at that. And those tattoos, at least some of them, paint a picture of why he became one. You know, I think my biggest thing for tattoos and who I am is I don't really blend in into certain environments. Um, and that kind of helps to my favor, to my benefit, uh, as I'm able to walk through and actually be heard and be listened to because I'm not who that they expect to walk in the door and, and to just talk about agriculture and things. Um, and so for my, for my story, it definitely lends to who I am as a person now. Um, my tattoos have have grown and developed over the years uh, into different different styles and 
Uh, it kind of, we, we say my, my half my body is completely different. One is kind of black and white is like my past. And then going into the right side of my body is all full color. Um, and I kind of purposely did it that way. And to understand the man and leader Cam has become, it's important to know a little bit about his past. His youth was a troubled one. He was in and out of group homes and by the age of 17, found himself facing the challenge of a lifetime, fatherhood. That's when Cam says he buckled down, eventually landing a job at the Cracker Barrel in Noonan, Georgia. Turns out that job as a dishwasher would lead to a successful career in the culinary and restaurant industry. I don't know, I took it serious and wanted to grow and was started to see that even though the paychecks were minimal, they were able to take care of, of me and my son and, and was able to pay my bills and still be in high school at the time. And I moved up to prep cook, I moved up to line cook and then line lead. And, and then I discovered, well, this is something I'm good at. Mm -hmm. Like, why not continue to try and develop this? I'm, I'm happy here, I'm good at this. At least I think I was. <laughs> um, and it was just something that came natural. I'll say. These days, Cam is the culinary director and partner at Sue and Sue Restaurants, a group that owns a wide variety of establishments, including Sweet Auburn Barbecue, both in Atlanta and now McDonough. However, it was that first job after Cracker Barrel where Cam says he became obsessed with agriculture and the farm to table concept. That place, Saren B Farms. So I met my wife. Uh, my wife is still there to this day and I just, I went there seeing this farm and this restaurant and I was like, it's just fine dining concept in the middle of nowhere in, in Chattahoochee Hills. And, and I, I experienced that they've got this farm. They've got these, these farm to table procedures. And so there's a lot of restaurants out there that are, that are farm to table, quote unquote. But in reality, we're not growing pineapple groves. We're not growing limes and those things here in this area, but there's amazing amount of agriculture and, and farmers in Georgia that I think my obsession has been, if you're a chef, you have the number one dramatic input and effect on these farmers in Georgia, you know? Um, but it's finding multiple farmers. We don't really have the, the landscape, we don't really have the footprint for one farm in Georgia to, to supply for one restaurant. Uh, so why not find five? They might all have different potatoes, but support all five, and you can have a potato from all five. You know, and so that's kind of been my mission is how do we find these small farms that are trying to make it and push them into agriculture and, and, and then into the restaurants. One way he's hoping to find those farms is through networking. And let me tell you, Cam's network is pretty extensive. He's active on social media, the legislative arena, school classrooms, and of course, his communications with young farmers throughout the state. In May of 2021, he and a business partner started a nonprofit called Maze Farmers Market, a platform with the goal of showcasing small farmers to the public. And if all that wasn't enough, Cam routinely hosts harvest days and farm tours, as well as something he calls the Homestead Series. That's also where Cam teaches the art and skill of processing livestock. This is more than just having 100 acres, producing a row crop or producing an animal, how can we focus on agriculture? How can we support these farmers? And I think that's my biggest focus is building a team to support those farmers that have 100 acres. Because a lot of times they're out there in the middle of nowhere in their own. They're on their own. They don't have as many resources or connections until they go to a farm bureau office, you know, um, or some of the other avenues they go through. And so that's kind of been my focus is not only do you not have to be a farmer with a full-scale operation to care about ag. You can purely just involve yourself in any capacity, and you can start by assisting. And even if you're just, even if you just drive and bring them some seeds, that helps. Even if you can just speak up for them at a Publix, you know, at a Publix parking lot with another stranger. Hey, have you ever heard of this farm? You know, Love Love Farm is doing some amazing things. You know, those little small touches really build a bigger impact and that's kind of what I'm focusing on. Well he is certainly determined to make a difference isn't he? Well don't forget if you missed any part of Cam's story or others on today's program you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel The Farm Monitor 
Once there, you'll find everything from instructional videos to research, as well as some very emotional human interest stories. Best of all, the archive dates all the way back to 2009. And once done there, keep clicking and like the Farm Monitor Facebook page. We always tell people if you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or the address that is on your screen there. It is news at farm-monitor.com. Early mornings, hard work and a lot of heart. Watch as these Georgia farm kids take on daily chores to keep their family's operation running strong. That's next when the Farm Monitor continues. Fifty years ago, farmers didn't have much of a choice but to apply their inputs in a uniform way across each field. The same amount of pesticides, the same amount of fertilizer, and so on. They were limited by the equipment of their time. Today's farmers, however, have an advantage. They have access to technology and equipment that can vary the amount of inputs applied to their land. The ability to vary inputs is essential for efficient crop production because different parts of a field have different needs. This is one of the primary goals of precision farming, matching the application of inputs to the soil. Precision farming technology can work both to the farmer's and the environment's benefit, but only if the farmer has a solid understanding of his or her field and can transfer that knowledge to their machinery. One way this is achieved is by identifying areas called management zones. A management zone can break that field into smaller portions to then help the farmer manage those um, similar soils in similar areas of the field in a, a way that really optimizes the productivity of that crop. Unfortunately, creating these management zones is more complex than it sounds. There are a multitude of factors that play into the composition of a soil. Farmers need two things. One, they need tools to quickly measure variations in soil properties. And two, they need methods to help them pinpoint exactly which areas of the field are most alike. In the early 2000s, the research team within the Cropping Systems and Water Quality Research Group worked together to create a software package that helps us to create management zones. That software is called Management Zone Analyst. Management Zone Analyst, or MZA, allows farmers to input recent soil and crop information. Then the software mathematically identifies like areas for zone creation. The idea is that we can take a field and give it whatever inputs we need, whether it be to topography, slope, curvature, um, whether it be soil measurements, soil conductivity, texture, whatever we want to put into it, it will take the field and divide it into homogeneous regions. The software also helps farmers and crop consultants determine the optimal number of management zones for a given field. MZA was made free to the public so all producers have the opportunity to benefit from it researchers, farmers, commodity organization representatives, and agricultural consultants from more than 39 states and 35 countries have used MZA in managing their crops. I think MZA has had a pretty strong impact, not only with farmers, but also with educating the next, uh, the next generation. There's a lot of use of MZA, not only by farmers and consultants, but by agriculture, programs around the country and even around the world. Along with MZA, the research group's pioneering work on management zones has been integrated into many facets of the crop industry over the years, leading to more efficient farming worldwide. Well, Mercedes-Benz Stadium was abuzz with excitement recently as state leaders gathered for the 16th annual Georgia FFA Blue and Gold Gala. Our Ray D'Alessio serving as MC for this year's gala, looking sharp there, joined by Georgia Farm Bureau President Tom McCall and his lovely wife, Jane. The night filled with celebrations of Georgia FFA and its many accomplishments over the past year, and guests generously donated toward the organization's initiatives. The gala ending on a high note, with everyone looking forward to a brighter future for these young men and women. Yeah, absolutely. Great time by all. Huge thanks to everybody at Georgia FFA for 
letting me be a part of that. Really enjoyed it. You look sharp. Finally this week, as we all know, when it comes to farming, there is no such thing as downtime. Nope. Work on the farm never ends, does it? That's something the youngest members of the Long family in Bainbridge know all too well. Our Jennifer Parson caught up with them as they were doing their daily chores. I feed the horses. I help with the cows. I pay strawberries. These siblings work together on their family farm in South Georgia. Everyone is involved from the oldest member of the family to the youngest. It takes everyone to make a farm go round. You'll find 10 year old Addison, the oldest of the long children, taking care of the family's horses and working the produce stand. I restock the vegetables and stuff that we have up at the barn. She feeds her horse peanut hay, which despite its name, isn't actually made from peanuts at all. It's actually like a different plant, but they just call it peanut hay because um, the plants in the peanut family. Her tasks don't stop at just feeding the horses. She has to groom them too. Especially um, before like the, it, it rains because sometimes if you if there's like dirt um, and it rains, you can get rain rot on your horse and sometimes it gets infected and it can be um, really serious and like cause an, a really bad infection. And before you saddle them, you also have to groom them so the saddle and the saddle pad doesn't rub with the dirt because that could be really uncomfortable. There's something called the hoof pick where you have to pick up their feet and pick inside so that like no, they don't get any stone bruises or anything when you ride. We feed them in the morning about seven o'clock and in the evening around four or five. Ah. I'll scratch it over there, the gray and brown one. Eight-year-old Wyatt spends his time with this outspoken herd. The cows are more afraid of you, especially the calves. But they are actually pretty cute, though. You can't resist their smiles. I need help. While they do graze on the grass in their fields, Wyatt also feeds them mineral. Because it's healthier and more nutritious than the grass. Now I can tell a boy cow from a girl cow. You see how the girl cow shapes are? And the bulls have a lump on their head like that, and then like a fur coat like that. I like a lion. Somehow I wonder why they move. There's a bunch of big softies. I'll bark no bite. I will keep my shirt and soft berries. Five-year-old Warren loves to pick red berries on the farm. But they queen too. But they but that means they're not ready. With over 15,000 plants per acre, Warren has his work cut out for him. Strawberry loose. It's important for them to be involved so they can have a respect an understanding of the day-to-day -day runnings of a farm if they choose to do it themselves one day. Their mother, Kelly Long, says there's so much to learn on the farm, but the most important thing she hopes to teach is from um, manufacturing the seeds to the trucker that brought the bags of seed to the farmer, to the farmer who looked after it, to the harvest crew, to the trucker again, that got it to um, the grocery store. It's a whole network of people. S stuff doesn't just come from the grocery store. It, can't, it comes from farms. And it's very important to know where your food came from, to know that someone grew it for them. It just didn't come out of the grocery store. In Bainbridge, I'm Jennifer Parson reporting for the Farm Monitor. Well, before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes and what's happening on Georgia farms. Be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe. Have a great week.